welcome to the History of Modern Greece. I'm your host, Daniel Roberts, and I'm here with my father, George, and our theme music is brought to you by Mark Youngerman. This is a podcast that covers the events from the fall of ancient Greece to the modern day. This is episode 25, Rise of the Huns. Welcome back to the History of Modern Greece. This is episode 13, Rise of the Huns. After the crisis of the 3rd century and eventually the reunification of the Roman Empire in 324 CE, the Romans faced another invading enemy from the north. Over the last two centuries, the Roman Empire experienced invasion after invasion from Germanic tribes in the north and east, from the Saxons, Franks, and Vandals and Goths. Goths in the east were known as Ostrogoths, or Eastern Goths, and Goths in the west were known as Visigoths, or Western Goths, but they were really the same tribal people. These violent incursions from the Germanic tribes grew more and more frequent, and even desperate at times. The last two centuries, according to the central Greenland temperature chart, were the lowest temperatures in thousands of years. Drought had caused famines and were forcing great migrations of people, and this led to what is known as the Great Migration Period. What the Romans didn't understand at the time was that the Germanic tribes were not the true invaders. They were refugees from an even greater enemy chasing them. The Germanic tribes were pinned between the deadly Roman Empire and an enemy so dangerous that they felt they would have better odds fighting the Romans. I am referring to the Huns, a nomadic tribe from the Eurasian steppe. We're going to back the narrative up and explain the origin of the Huns to give you a better understanding of the entire story. What we know for sure is that the word Hun was used to describe steppe tribes in general, but there is a hypothesis that states the Huns who invaded Europe in the 4th century CE were the same steppe people that invaded northern China several centuries earlier. There is a substantial amount of evidence to back this theory up. The Romans had no idea who the Huns really were or where they came from, and a Roman historian is quoted as saying that the Huns had no religion. There was a traditional religious belief of Eurasian steppe tribes, and it is likely that the Huns either practiced this or at least were familiar with this practice. They were reverent of the natural elements of nature, rain, snow, fire, lightning, wind, and believed these forces were created by a sky god above who wielded them for his pleasure on earth. The Turkic and Mongol steppe tribes called this sky god Tengri, and it is likely the Huns were aware of this god as well. There are also theories that the Huns were sword worshippers and would literally swear on the sword as though the sword itself was divine. The Shanu go back to 3000 BCE and were a group of nomadic people that lived in tents and herded animals. The Chinese always viewed them as others, or barbarians, and fought to keep them off their lands. In 323 BCE, the Shan Nu invaded northern China, the Zhou dynasty, and captured some of their northern territory. But the Chinese eventually drove them out. As the Zhou dynasty collapsed and China entered the Warring States period, the Shan Nu raids continued into the northern agricultural lands. In 221 BCE, the Chinese warring states were unified under Emperor Qing Shi Huang. This new emperor immediately reinforced his northern territory and expelled any Shan Nu raiders from China. Back home, the Shan Nu were struggling next to their neighbors and were suffering defeat after defeat, losing territory. And when the Shan Nu were on the verge of collapse, a new chief came to power named Temud. Temud was at war with a neighboring horse tribe to the west and ended up giving one of his sons, Modin, to them as a hostage. For some reason, Temud attacked the neighboring tribe while they held his son hostage, believing that they would kill him and he could pass the leadership of his tribe to his other son. However, his son escaped the neighboring tribe and returned to his father on a stolen horse. Believing his son was favored by the sky god Tengri, he gave his son 10,000 horsemen to command. The first thing Modin did with his 10,000 men was trained them to follow his every command. It is said that wherever Modin fired his arrow, the rest of his men would follow suit, and 10,000 arrows would follow. He started by hunting animals and firing his arrow at the animal, and those who did not follow suit were immediately beheaded. Next, he shot his favorite horse with an arrow, and his men followed suit. Those who did not were immediately beheaded. Then, Modin shot his wife, and those who did not follow suit were immediately immediately beheaded. And finally, Modin shot his dad's favorite horse. And this time, every single person fired upon the horse. 
And now Modin believed his men were truly ready. Modin was angry with his father for giving him away to their neighboring tribe and then attacking them while he was held hostage. So on a hunting trip with his men, he fired an arrow in the direction of his father and every one of his men followed suit, firing their arrows in the same direction, killing Temud. Modin then seized power and had all of his immediate family executed so they could not rise up and try to take power away from him. Once Modin had control of the tribe, he waged war against his neighbors and brought the conquered tribes under his control, forming a kind of proto-state. This early conquest brought many tribal people into Shannu control that were agricultural and nomadic. As they got to the southern border of Shannu territory, there were towns and small cities under their control. So the Shannu Huns were not purely a nomadic people, although its leadership was. By 203 BCE, the Shanu Huns controlled a vast portion of the eastern steppe, but the territory that bordered the Han Dynasty was home to the majority of its settled towns and small cities. These small towns were the front line for the trading network that occurred between the Shanu and the Han Dynasty. Modin later took the title of Shan Yu, which was a Chinese word for emperor. He saw himself as an equal to the great Han Dynasty. It is not confirmed, but it is very likely that the Shan Yu had a capital back in the steppe where they handled the administrative offices of their confederacy. Below the rank of Shan Yu, the emperor, there were four horns, two in the west and two in the east. These four commanders were usually relatives of the Shan Yu, brothers or nephews, and typically one of them was the heir to the Shan Yu. Below the rank of the four horns were 24 commanders, with personal control over 10,000 horsemen. In the northern region of China is a geographical region called the Ordus Loop, where the grasslands of the Eurasian steppe come down into the agricultural land of northern China. The Chinese always knew the importance of securing this territory because it could serve as a corridor for the barbarian horse tribes to the north. So they erected a large wall and several fortresses protecting this valley and even forced a lot of peasants to settle the land, creating a buffer between the Chinese empire and the Eurasian steppe. However, a civil conflict weakened the defenses of the Ordus Loop and Modin took advantage of this and invaded through the Ordus Corridor into the green agricultural land of northern northern China. The emperor of the Han dynasty could not tolerate an incursion from the Shanu, so he mustered an army and marched north to repel the invaders. However, the Chinese army was comprised mostly of foot soldiers, while the Shanu army was mostly horse archers. His army could not defeat the Shanu, so the emperor made an alliance between the two nations by marrying his sister to Modin. In 174 BCE, Modin died and Lao Shan took power as the new Shen Yu. And Lao Shan wasted no time in sending 10,000 horse archers into the northern province, breaking the alliance. Shortly afterwards, a new peace treaty was formed through another marriage alliance. During this peace period between Shan Nu and the Han Dynasty, trade in the Ordos Valley was at a maximum. Chinese traders would exchange luxury items like silk and jewels for Shan Nu war horses. This trade made both parties wealthy, but the alliance between the two was always shaky at best as the Shan Nu were prone to raid into the northern provinces every time there was a succession to power. In 140 in 41 BCE, the Chinese emperor heard that there was a valley to the east in modern-day Uzbekistan that held some of the fastest war horses in the known world. He concocted a plan to march across Asia and secure these horses for his army. The emperor was successful and established a horse trading network that crossed from China around the Himalayas and into Central Asia. This trading route became one of the major passages for the famous Silk Road. The Chinese cavalry, for the first time, had superior horses to the Shan Nu, and he focused his attention to his northern provinces in the Ordos Valley. In 133 BCE, the Shan Nu Han War began, and it did not end for another 40 years. The Han Dynasty won battle after battle and chased the Shan Nu out of northern China and back across the Gobi Desert to the Eurasian Steppe. However, the Han Emperor wasn't going to let the desert stop him from getting to the Shan Nu Huns. 
In 119 BCE, the emperor sent an expedition north across the desert and surprised the Shanu prince in a battle in the eastern steppe. The Han dynasty quickly killed or captured the Shanu prince's army. While the first raiding party continued its campaign north, killing all the Shanu it came across, a second army was sent across the Gobi Desert, this time raiding the Shanu from the west. This second army was made up of leftover troops who didn't make the cut for the first invasion. So this army was naturally weaker. When they finally finished their march across the desert, they arrived tired and hungry and encountered the entire Shanu army waiting for them in battle formation. Seeing that his army was at a disadvantage, the leader of the Chinese army ordered his heavy carts to the front of the line to create a barricade against the charging Shanu horse archers. This proved effective at preventing the horse archers from breaking through the ranks and the Chinese cavalry quickly mopped up any that made it through the barricade. All the while, Chinese archers pelted the Shanu with arrows from behind the barricade. The battle continued for the rest of the day without either side gaining any ground, until a sandstorm came in from the desert and shrouded the battlefield. Seeing his opportunity, the Chinese general ordered a cavalry charge from the two flanks and used his superior horses to destroy the Shanu army from the sides. The Shan Yu escaped with only a few hundred men. The Chinese generals followed the Shan Yu for over a hundred miles to their capital and burnt it to the ground. Over the next century, the Shan Yu broke up into two different tribes, the Northern Shan Yu and the Southern Shan Yu. The Southern Shan Yu became a client state of the Han Dynasty and fought with the Chinese to expel the Northern Shan Yu. The Northern Shan Yu migrated west, where they settled in the mountains in Central Asia. While they lived in refuge in the mountains, they were surrounded by other dangerous nomadic tribes of the steppe. Life was very hard in the mountains, and when the great cooling period of the 2nd century CE started, the grasslands suffered from a catastrophic drought. This entire time, the Han dynasty was pursuing them from the east, keeping them at bay, while other powers from the west kept the Shanu Huns from migrating any further west. When the Han dynasty collapsed and fractured into three smaller kingdoms, and the other nomadic tribes to the west collapsed, the Shanu Huns were suddenly free to do as they pleased. They began their migration west into Western Asia and Eastern Europe, where they encountered native populations, including the Germanic tribes. By the beginning of the 3rd century CE, the Shanu Huns crossed into the Ural Mountains. From this point in the story, we'll refer to them as just Huns. It has been centuries since these people lived as the Shanu Huns across the desert north of China. And the steppe is a very fluid place, with some tribes containing multiple ethnicities. All of our historic sources of the Huns come from either the Chinese or the Romans. And because it took hundreds of years for them to migrate out of Central Asia and into Eastern Europe, there's going to be a gap in the story. The Romans didn't even know the Huns existed, yet they knew that the Chinese existed. But when the Huns exploded onto the scene, it caused one of the biggest migrations in human history. North of the Roman Empire was considered to be barbaric and uncivilized, but they also liked to categorize the barbarians. According to the Romans, there were two major groups living in the frontier the Germans and the Scythians. Then they broke each of these groups down further. There is very little information, but we know the Huns conquered everyone they ran up against. When they raided a village, it was fast, it was violent, and without mercy. The Huns started to expand further west, and they ran into Germanic tribes, and they started to conquer them. The Alans fell first, and the refugees went fleeing into Roman territory, wrecking havoc. Meanwhile, back in Rome, in 337 CE, Constantine the Great died. He had been ill for a while and knew death was near. So he ordered his men to take him to the River Jordan to be baptized where Jesus was said to have been baptized nearly 300 years earlier. It is said that he waited until the very end of his life to be baptized so he could get away with as much sin as possible before getting saved. He tried to return home to Constantinople but died on the way in a small estate in Nicomedia. He was given his funeral rites by the Arian bishop Eusebius, so that just shows where his head was at on his deathbed. On his deathbed, After working so hard to unite the Roman Empire and unify the church, Constantine divided up amongst his sons. Either he always intended for the strongest son to kill all of his brothers and unite the empire, or else Constantine lost his mind near the end. To make matters even worse, some of them were devout Catholics and others were devout Arians. 
War broke out between brothers, and over the next 25 years, the sons of Constantine would wage civil war against each other and fight against the Sassanids on the eastern frontier and the Goths in the north. In 350 CE, Constans was assassinated, leaving Constantius II, the only surviving son of Constantine the Great. In 353 CE, Constantius II defeated the last claimant to the throne and became the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. Before we referred to the central Greenland temperatures chart and pointed out that the last 200 years had been the coldest in thousands of years. Even the cold temperatures that occurred during the Greek Dark Ages, after the collapse of the Bronze Age, were not as cold as this. But things were starting to change. 320 CE to 390 CE saw steady rises in temperature. Constantius II spent most of his sole rule fighting across the Danube against the Alumani tribe and managed to get a peace deal out of them. He also wasn't as harsh against the pagans and even elevated a pagan priest to a government position. Constantius II was a lenient Christian and considered himself to be semi-Aryan. He even called several ecumenical councils to convince the church to become more semi-Aryan so they could heal the wound growing between the Nicene Creed and the Aryans. However, he didn't succeed and was later to be deemed a heretic. And don't think that this made him an ever-tolerant emperor. He still managed to pass several laws that discriminated against Jews, including forbidding them to own Christian slaves or marrying Christian women. In 355 CE, Constantius II appointed his nephew Julian to the role of Caesar to prepare for a succession. Now, this initially helped Constantius Constantius by allowing Julian to deal with the Franks and the Alumani invading from the north, while Constantius tried to fight off the attacking Sassanids on his eastern frontier. In 357 CE, Julian led his army against the Franks and Alumani in a famous battle where the Romans defeated the German army three times their size. Constantius was very lucky to have Julian on his side, helping him to keep the empire together. In 360 CE, Julian was proclaimed Augustus by his army sparking a civil war with his uncle. All the while, the Sassanids were still attacking them from the east. In 361 CE, Constantius II died, and Julian was left the sole emperor of the Roman Empire. Julian is known to history as Julian the Apostate because he was not a Christian and even tried to reverse the whole Christian Empire position put in place by Constantine before him. Julian was an old school Roman Emperor. He even attempted to build a third Jewish temple, not to help the Jews as much as to hurt Christianity. With all of this bickering and fighting between the heirs of Constantine, a growing number of Germanic raids are occurring on the frontier. The Goths and Vandals that came to their border were terrified refugees, and the Romans greeted their desperation with great open arms with such deals as selling the Gothic refugees food in exchange for giving their children up for slavery. This is seriously how the Romans treated the Germanic tribes, and maybe had they known that they were fleeing a horde of deadly Huns, they might not have treated them so badly. But they did treat them horribly, and this created a huge hatred between the Goths and the Romans. This wasn't helped by the fact that Roman armies often hired Goths to fight as their soldiers. Tension was growing. In 363 CE, Julian focused his attention at the growing threat in the east, the Sassanid Empire. This was a true threat to the empire, and finally it was getting the attention it deserved. Julian marched his armies east into Syria and down into Mesopotamia and Babylon, taking the old route of Alexander the Great. There he met the Persians in battle at the capital of Ctesiphon. He was charging into battle against the Persians and wasn't wearing his proper body armor when he was struck by a spear and killed in battle. This left his army trapped in the heartland of Persian territory and without a leader. The Roman army surrendered and ceded eastern territory to the growing Sassanid Empire. With the early death of Julian, it's hard to tell what kind of reforms he could have brought to the empire. He was on his way to get rid of the Christians as well as get rid of the Sassanids. And who knows, maybe even conquer the Persian Empire and bring the borders right up to the edge of China. But it wasn't meant to be and Rome was forced to sign a treaty so embarrassing that the poor guy who inherited the throne after Julian was murdered only eight months later. In 364 CE, Valentinian I inherited the throne and he gave the eastern provinces to his brother Valens. He knew it would be difficult to rule the entire empire on his own, and he trusted his brother. 
This was a turbulent time as the Germans were stepping up their raids, and it took everything the Roman army had to fight off these barbarians. No matter how much they fought and killed them, the damn Germans just kept coming back. The Romans still didn't know the Germanic barbarians were fleeing from something. Something terrible. In 365 CE, Emperor Valens knew he had to deal with the growing problem on his eastern borders, the Sassanid Empire. So he gathered an army and marched east, across Anatolia. Unfortunately, the act of leaving the capital city to go on campaign meant Constantinople was open for usurpers. Eventually, the practice of leaving the capital to go on campaign would cease altogether, and emperors would often spend their entire lives in the capital. Emperor Valens' maternal cousin Procopius claimed the throne for himself and led an insurrection. It isn't easy to just walk in and proclaim yourself emperor. In fact, it is impossible. You have to have the support of the army and have them declare you the emperor. Procop Procopius had the support of two legionnaires, and after seizing the throne, he had the army seal the gates to the capital and cut off all forms of communication. He then spun propaganda to the people, telling them that Emperor Valens was killed in battle, making the people accept and support him. Now you would think that Emperor Valens would have turned around and gone right back to Constantinople and taken back his throne, but that is not what happened. Emperor Valens found himself outside of the capital with an army but not a big enough army to get through the walls of the city. And he just became sad, and even thought about just accepting his cousin's claim to the throne and killing himself. I mean, his army was already in Syria fighting the war. He marched them out to fight in the first place. Procopius sent word to the Gothic tribes living north of the, Dan the Danube to come inside, to come to his aid against Emperor Valen, and he would give them land within the empire to settle. The Goths jumped at this opportunity, and they immediately began to organize a raiding party to come south and aid Procopius in his coming civil war. However, Emperor Valens managed to lift himself up by his own bootstraps and soldier on, and managed to help his cause that his army that did cross into Syria actually won all of its battles and retook the eastern provinces back into the Roman fold. And once he had victory in Anatolia, he reorganized his legionnaire his legionnaires and sent them back to Constantinople to face the usurper Procopius. In 366 CE, the lieutenants of Emperor Valens met Procopius and his legionnaires in battle. And as soon as they came face to face and the rebellion army saw the full Roman military face them, they defected and even turned on Procopius, capturing and cutting off his head and sending it to the emperor for verification. Unfortunately for the Goths who side with Procopius, they never got the message that he was dead. And they raided into the Roman Empire and raided several villages and cities along the way. They had an army of 30,000 men and were able to do quite a bit of damage and probably could have tipped the scales in Procopius' advantage if they had arrived a little earlier. This of course got the immediate attention of Emperor Valens. In 367 CE, Emperor Valens marched an army to the Danube and crossed the river to deal with the Goths on their side of the river. His army crushed the Visigoths and chased most of them out of their homeland. After no conclusion the first season, he returned with a bigger army and raided their home homeland, forcing the Visigoths to come out of the mountains and face him in battle, where the Romans defeated the Visigoths. In 369 CE, the Roman Emperor Valens sailed across the Danube to meet the Gothic king Athanaric. It was a big deal to have the head of the mighty Roman Empire meet a barbarian king in person, let alone cross the Danube into the land of the barbarians. The Romans had every reason not to trust the Goths. For almost 200 years, they had been raiding into Roman territory, killing thousands of peasants. However, the Roman army had defeated their armies and were now here to get a peace treaty out of the Gothic king. Athanaric was a Turvingian Goth, which meant forest goth, and they were a settled civilization. They had cities and wore armor similar to the Romans. They even wore similar clothing and ate similar food, but they were definitely not Roman. They were goths, but remarkably civilized, especially compared to the Romans. Living so close to the Roman Empire for centuries had a way of rubbing off on people. Now, north of the Turvingi Goths were a tribe called the 
Gruthungi Goths that translated into Goths of the Steppe. These were nomadic Goths, similar linguistically and maybe even religiously, but culturally they were steppe people. It was originally thought that the Goths came from Scandinavia, but archaeological evidence suggests that they came out of the forests of northern Poland. When Emperor Valens met the Gothic king, it looked like he was going to deal them a harsh peace settlement. But he actually restored a lot of their privileges they had decades earlier. Valens wanted to wrap things up in the Danube as fast as he could and focus his attention at the growing threat in the east. The Persians were the true enemy of the Roman Empire. The Gothic king Athanaric returned to his kingdom north of the Danube only to hear of a growing threat in the east. Entire villages on the frontier disappeared. A darkness was coming. And when I say darkness, I refer to the fact that communication with their villages far away ceased. And then shortly after, communication from a village a little closer ceased. And it quickly became apparent that their settlements were being destroyed by a new superpower. The enemy was set to ride in on horseback and kill everyone in the village, leaving only smoldering ruins and dead bodies. The riders were said to have deformed skulls and ritual scars all over their faces to terrify their enemies. The Huns had finally arrived in Europe, and the Goths were in their path. In 371 CE, Valens had made a lot of progress fighting against the Persians, solidifying his eastern provinces. However, word quickly made it to the Roman Emperor that the Sassanid Persians were reorganizing their army and preparing for another assault against the Roman Empire. While the Emperor prepared his men a new fortress for the inevitable attack from the Persians, reports started to trickle in from the north of heavy fighting occurring north of the Danube. These reports of fighting in the north quickly turned into a full-scale crossing of Goths into the Danube. They were fleeing in mass. In 375 CE, King Ermanric of the Gruthungi Goths went to war with the Huns. This war was not like any other war we have covered so far. The Goths had a strong infantry army, but they also had a strong cavalry. Living on the edge of the steppe, they had, had allowed the Goths to develop a good grasp of riding horses. But the Huns were un unlike any other army they had ever faced. The entire army was on horseback and they galloped at full speed. They would break off into bands and circle the Gothic army, looking for weak spots to exploit. And every rider was an excellent shot with a composite bow. The Huns weren't engaging the Goths in battle. They were herding them and hunting them like prey, circling around, trapping them in a group and pelting them with arrows until the last man was dead. They hunted the Goths the same way they hunted a herd of deer. The Goths fought bravely in many battles, but every time the Huns destroyed them. In 376 CE, King Ermanric was so desperate to save his people that he offered himself up to the pagan high priest of his tribe and was ritually sacrificed. This move could either have been a desperate move to save his people, or maybe his people were angry with his failures and just demanded it of him. Either way, the great Gothic king was dead. With the king sacrificed to the gods, the Gothic warriors assembled the rest of their fighting men and prepared to meet the Huns again in battle. This time they were determined to chase the Huns out of their land and hopefully get back to some sort of peace. Unfortunately for the Goths, the Huns they had faced so far were just a small band of Huns that had ridden up ahead of the main army. All of this death and destruction and it was only their scouting party. The Huns' main army was still dealing with matters in the east, but they were coming. The new king of the Goths, Vithamir, went charging out to meet the Huns in battle, probably feeling like all of the gods were on his side because of his previous king's valiant sacrifice, but was immediately killed by the Huns. With their king dead, the Gothic army was broken up into two led by its top two commanders, who were really nothing more than warlords. After another defeat, the Goths made the decision to take their entire civilization and abandon their homes. Hundreds of thousands of Goths moved as fast as they could west, hoping to outrun the Huns. The Gruthungi Goths made it to the river, where they encountered an army of Thuringi Goths, their old neighbors who had fled before. The Gruthungi were happy to see familiar faces. While the two armies met on the side of the river, the Huns caught up to the Gruthungi Goths 
and tens of thousands of black arrows rained down on them from the rear. Scattering in mass panic, the Grithungi army and civilians ran west to the Danube River and the border of the Roman Empire. While the Grithungi ran into Roman territory, the Thuringi Goths, led by King Athanaric, Athanaric, retreated to the Carpathian Mountains, where they fortified themselves into the steep hills to set up a defensive fortress to protect them from the Huns. However, they were repeatedly attacked by the Huns, and they were never able to complete their fortification. And so a new leader of the Thuringi, Fridigar, on an Aryan Christian led what remained other people to the Roman border. To seek sanctuary, King Athanaric and a few brave soldiers stayed behind in the mountains to fight against the Huns. Fritigar requested asylum from the great Eastern Roman Emperor Valens. However, Emperor Valens was busy fighting his war in the east with Persia. Emperor Valens couldn't afford to take any of his troops away from the eastern borders, so he settled with the Thurungi and allowed them to cross the Danube in mass as long as they converted to Aryan Christianity was favored by Valens, and agreed to fight for the Romans against any other barbarians trying to cross the river. This wasn't a small migration either. This was the entire nation of Thurungi Goths crossing at once, and the chaos that followed resulted in mass exploitation of the Goths, including many families being enslaved, and the able-bodied men being instantly conscripted into the Roman army. This was exasperated with a shortage of food, and soon the once proud Gothic people were reduced to subjection and humiliation. The Gruthungi Goths, still on the other side of the Danube, saw their friends and allies make it across the river to safety, most likely unaware of the terrible conditions they were subjected to, or not caring, because staying behind meant certain death. They crossed the Danube in an attempt to make the same deal with the Romans. However, the Romans already had too many Goths on their side of the river that they couldn't feed, and were not about to accept another wave of them. So they were refused entry into the Roman Empire. The Roman plan was to absorb the Thuringian soldiers into their army, and make Fritigar and his senior commanders officers in the Roman legionnaires. To celebrate, the Romans invited Fritigar and his commanders to a banquet. Now the plan was to trick the leaders of the Thuringians into drinks and food where they would be assassinated and the rest of the Goths would be absorbed under the Roman command. Now this had been done several times before and always seemed to work out in favor of the Romans and there was probably no reason to think it wouldn't work out this time. However, things didn't work out and Fritigar managed to escape the banquet and got back to his men and the result was a complete Gothic uprising from inside of the Roman borders. This resulted in a full-scale war where the Gothic army was joined by Thracian slaves and even other Goths who had settled in the Roman lands decades before. The Roman legionnaires assembled and marched out to meet the Gothic armies. The battle did not go well for the Romans and the Goths completely overwhelmed them, destroying their entire army. And this wasn't just any battle. This was the first battle in what would later be known as the Gothic Wars and ultimately would lead to the destruction of the Western Roman Empire. With the Roman army and the Balkans destroyed, there was no one left to keep the Goths from roaming through the countryside, pillaging villages, and taking any food they could find. All of this happened while Emperor Valens was off fighting the Persians in the eastern provinces. To make matters worse for the Emperor, the orders he gave to his military commanders in northern Greece to come to his aid in the east were ignored. It turned out that there were several top commanders in the Roman Roman army that were Goths, and as soon as they heard about a Gothic uprising, they turned on the Roman Emperor and joined their brethren in arms. As soon as chaos erupted in the northern provinces, there was no one left to keep the Gruthungi Goths across the Danube, and all at once, the entire nation crossed the river, flooding into the already ravaged provinces of the Balkans and northern Greece. In 377 CE, Emperor Valens began negotiations with assassinated Persians so he could return to the west and stop the invading Gothic armies. The fighting was so bad in the Eastern Empire that the Roman Emperor in the west sent reinforcements to help in the fighting. The Roman armies met up and finally engaged the Goths with the first organized resistance 
since the initial invasion. The fighting was bloody and the Romans lost a lot of soldiers, but they managed to push the Goths back. However, the fighting had been so costly that neither side could claim true victory. The Goths were held up on the northern side of the mountains and a narrow pass was the only way to get through. The Romans didn't have the men to chase the Goths, so they camped in the mountain pass, set up defenses and waited for reinforcements. All the while, the Goths tried again and again to break through the Roman line. At this point, the Goths seemed like mad warriors who attacked again and again, but the Romans did not know the Huns were behind the Goths attacking them from the rear. However, the Gothic leader Fritigar managed to gather allies and even convince a small band of Huns that had broken off from the main horde to help him overrun the Roman lines. The fighting grew more intense and eventually the Romans were forced to retreat from the mountain pass and head south, leaving the pass open for the Goths and allies to come flowing through. This time, the Goths came into Roman territory with more hatred than ever before, and they took their anger out on the poor peasants and farmers who lived in the area, slaughtering every single person they found and burning all of their houses to the ground. Well, that's it for today. Join us next time on the History of Modern Greece. See you next time. Stay safe and stay awesome. Stay awesome.